Hey, well, welcome back. It's Smart Fielding Pritchard here from ME Fieldings. My deepest apologies. I've had a few of you send me emails. When are we getting more training? We're late. We've got two really big projects on at the moment. Everyone's working flat out on. And then a smaller one, with a smaller project that was interesting. We're working for an organization in Britain looking at the conceptual framework. So I think maybe in a few weeks' time we'll have some um, training on the conceptual framework. Now we've put some, some effort into that. Right, we've done inventory part one, we've done inventory part two, and we've kind of looked at the hard parts of inventory, I think, in parts one and two. Inventory part three um, is nice, easy thing. This is something that certainly on um, an exam point of view, we get very, very few students who, who kind of suffer with this. And again, on a conceptual basis, it's very easy. Um, and a practical basis in real life, the stuff that we're going to come on and look at, FIFO, LIFO and so on, is actually much harder because it's all about identifying the transactions, identifying the items in question and identifying the data. So this is stuff that um, on paper, again, like the conceptual framework, looks very, very simple. But when you get out there into a warehouse and people are going, well, how do we do this and how do we do this? Um, it, it gets much harder, particularly when people start swapping systems. So you have FIFO for one area of your business, weighted average for another. Okay, so let's move on. Today is inventory part three. My name is Mark, Mark Fielding Pritchard. Once again, if you're now looking at this going, why am I watching this? I'm in the wrong presentation. If you've got any friends or anyone like that who's interested, please send them a link to this. You know, we're getting um, increasing numbers of people drifting through our website now. So good to hear, good to hear. If you have any questions, please send them in. We, we use your questions for running these training courses. So if you have a question, I can guarantee you there's 100,000 people out there in the internet world who have the same question. Okay, let's move on to slide two then. Inventory part three, where we're looking at inventory systems. And this is relevant for IPSAs and IFRS implementation, but also for students who are studying for ACCA, ICAW, Oh, and all that, so ICAST and so on and so forth. If you're in Britain, CPA as well, I guess, covers this. Thank you. Hey, so here we are on slide number two. All right, what we're looking at in slides number two and three is what we call inventory systems. So inventory systems, now your inventory system will be inside your Oracle or inside your SAP system. But there's two basic ways of doing this. One is what we call a perpetual system. Make sure I've spelt that right. Perpetual. Yeah, it's not underlined in red. Our perpetual system. And the second one is what we call a periodic system. So with a, a perpetual system, what you are doing is you are, as the name suggests, you are counting your inventory, counting your stock perpetually. So perpetually, this word in English means all the time. So you can see from the slide there, it says it creates a continuous record of quantities and costs. It used to be back in the day, and I'm old, old person. So back when I trained, it was really, really hard to do because most of your stock systems were manual. Um, so, you know, back in the days, back in the sort of 1970s and so on, it was difficult to do and was only really used in organizations um, such as banks. So they had a stock of cash, so they would be monitoring their cash because obviously cash is um, such a high risk item. As we've come through the 1980s, through the 1980s, we saw the invention of scanner machines and barcodes. So one of the first types of businesses that really brought this in was supermarkets. So you know in the supermarkets, you, you buy a tin of beans or whatever, you take it to the, to the cash desk, and then they, they hold that barcode under a barcode reader and it goes bip. And then you get an itemized bill that shows you every single item that you've purchased, and the cost and so on and you can see you can see where things go wrong um in supermarkets you're only seeing that what's called the customer interface or the customer side of that what you don't see is the stock the stock back side of it so in other words that there, there's a if you can imagine a mirror of that and the mirror is is the supermarket's own stock records so let's assume that you're in in a supermarket in edinburgh in, in my hometown when, when you go in, the supermarket itself has its own stock record. So if you're in Tesco's or wherever in Logie Green Road in, in Edinburgh, what will happen is, is that Logie Green Road has its own stock records. Logie Green Road is the name of the road. Yeah. 
Um, so Logie Green Road Tesco's is Tesco's is the name of the company has its own stock records. So when you buy that tin of beans, okay, you get your you get your bill that has a tin of beans on it. But Logie Green Road stock records reflect that one tin of beans has been sold, and those stock records measure what is in your in your store. Now the way that um, stock systems work, for example, for supermarkets, is they work on what's called a spider web system. So therefore, there will be usually anything between 15 and 100 supermarkets, and they will surround a central warehouse. So Tesco's will have a central warehouse somewhere, probably on the outskirts of Edinburgh. I don't actually know where theirs is, but let's assume on the outskirts of Edinburgh. And then the stock system will measure that the tin of beans in Logie Green Road has gone down. Now what happens is that it's measuring all the stock. They have what's called automatic reorder systems. So when the number of beans in Logie Green Road falls to a number, it automatically reorders from Tesco's central warehouse in Edinburgh and some more beans. Now, in fact, the way the system, I actually know this quite well because I used to work for Tesco's, not in Edinburgh, in, down in England. And what happens is, is that that order then sits in, in what's called a back order system. And all items in stock have a size. So everything is measured in Britain. In those days, it was in cubic meters. And therefore, it will order beans, it will order bottles of vodka, it will order, um, who knows what else, tins of dog food. And each one has a standard size. Each box has a standard size. And when it gets to a certain size, the order is processed. Now, the reason that size is so important is because your dog food, your tins of beans, your boxes of breakfast cereal go into a lorry. And so therefore, your order is processed when you have a lorry load. So once Logie Green Road needs enough items to fill a lorry, then the lorry will come from the central warehouse, from the central warehouse out to the Logie Green Road's. Um, supermarket and then you don't have half full lorries moving around the country all the time. At the central warehouse that will be connected to the purchasing department and it will also trigger purchases from suppliers. So therefore if your beans are coming up from Newcastle down in England or if Dundee or somewhere up in the nor northern parts of Scotland then what will happen is that it will automatically issue a purchase order out to those people and then they will deliver a number of beans. Again, the order will be equal in size to a, a lorry load to ensure that economies of scale are passed all the way along the line. Right, that's a perpetual inventory system to, to bring you back down to what you're doing. So therefore, um, when you have these perpetual inventory systems, you purchase a tin of beans. As far as the stock system is, concern, is concerned, it therefore adjusts the stock in the store. When the store gets low on beans, it will order from the central warehouse. When you have enough goods to fill a lorry to come from the central warehouse, it comes to the supermarket. And when the central warehouse gets low on beans, your stock system will automatically order from your supplier. Therefore, your stock system is completely compu computerized from the till where someone from the cash desk, the casa, where somebody is buying the goods right the way out to the purchase ordering system. Now, we, we all know that these stock systems can go wrong, and they do go wrong if people don't monitor them. I, I've certainly seen a lorry load of strawberry ice cream delivered once before. And when you get things like that, you can't send them back because when they come from the central warehouse to the store, the central warehouse is then reordering more. So it doesn't have space for these goods. So therefore, you ha also have um, a checking system and you will have in your supermarket, there will be at least one person, probably more, who periodically during the week will go around and will do stock takes. So they will check the number of beans in the warehouse, the number of beans on the shelf and so on to make sure that the stock records are correct because you do, you do get things which are wrong. People return goods. Goods are damaged, but they're shown on your stock. Da, 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 da. So you need to this this idea of checking and correcting. So even though it's perpetual, it's kept up to date. I have to say it's very very good. And most companies now, you know, outside of supermarkets, if you go into certainly manufacturing industries, if they're relatively small goods, they will have perpetual inventory systems. Okay. 
According to your textbooks, the alternative to a perpetual system is a periodic system. And a periodic system means that you have a physical stock count at some point in time. Because computer technology has moved on so much since most textbooks were written, and certainly since I started out a company that was called Coopers and Lime Rand, now called PricewaterhouseCoopers, back in the 1980s, um, you know, these kind of things have merged and the technologies come on and perpetual inventory systems have really taken over. But um, periodic systems still exist, particularly used for items where for items where it's not so critical, not they are not such high risk. I'll give you an example of this. Um, we had a big client that was a shipyard. So it's a client that manufactures ships. They use in the manner of fact in the manufacture of ships, in the manufacture of ships, they use things which are called rivets. Right, rivets is like a screw. So it's what actually holds the sheets of metal together when you manufacture a ship. They used thousands of these things. Right, the, the point is, is that they had a periodic system on them. They had a periodic system because no one was ever going to steal these. They're not like diamonds and they're not like money or something like that. You know, if you steal them, there's nothing that you can do with them. However, they're very, very dangerous for the organization. And when I say dangerous, it's dangerous that you run out of these things. Because if you run out of them, then the guys who are the fitters and the welders on your shipyard can't work. So you end up waiting three days for the damn things to be delivered, and you've got to pay these guys for three days to sit and do nothing. Right, that's the kind of item where you would use a periodic system. In fact, what they did, they had what was called in their manuals a two-bin system. They would have a bin of rivets and the guys would go along and they would take a big scoop of rivets and put them in a, in a pocket on the front of their working overalls. And what happened was, was you always had two bins. So therefore, when bin number one was empty, you might started to use bin number two. As soon as you started to use bin number two, a reorder was made to the supplier and a new bin came. And when we're talking about a bin, we're, we're talking about something that's tens of thousands of these things came at once. There was lots and lots of them. They used them all over the place. So that's an example of what we call a two bin reorder system. You really don't see them very much anymore. In good old manufacturing industries in the 1960s, it was very common. Right, back to our periodic system. So therefore, what we're doing is we're counting our goods periodically. So at some period in time, instead of this kind of idea of monitoring them perpetually through, through a computer system. I'll give you another example of this. This was a really good example. We, we had a client that ran a chain across Scotland and the north of England, a chain of jewellery stores. So jewellery, they were manufacturing jewellery. And they had a periodic stocking system. And it was the system that they called the ABC system because they classified all of their items as either A, B or C. Right, items that were classified as A were counted in the morning and in the evening. So they were certain specific types of precious stones. So pure, pure cut diamonds, certain types of sapphires, and so on and so forth, plus money. They used to count the money in the morning and the afternoon as well. And they would count orders as well, check orders that had come in and orders dispatched as well. Right, the point was, was that the money, and particularly the stones themselves, were very, very expensive and they're very easy to steal. So, you know, it wasn't like accusing all of your staff, but it's just standard procedure for honest people to count their jewelry morning and afternoon. And so it was small, high value items, particularly expensive watches as well, they counted. That was what we call class A. Remember, our periodic system is what we call an ABC system. So A was counted nine o'clock in the morning, six o'clock at night, and was very high risk items. Items which were B were counted once every week, usually on a Friday afternoon. These were items which could be at risk, but generally weren't. Um, things like gold. Gold, certainly in Britain, because it's so expensive, is very low quality. In other words, the, the, qual the amount of gold in a gold ring is actually a lot lower than you would imagine. The standard in Britain is 37.5%. 
So only 37.5% of a gold ring is actually gold. The rest of it is, you know, tin mainly. Because gold actually is too soft to make rings, so you have to stiffen it up anyway. Even 24 karat gold is not gold. Those items were, were calculated, were calculated, were counted, um, something like once a week. And the point was is that they were of a less risk, but still there was a need to count them. And then there was the C items. C items was the things which nobody ever stole. Um, so little screws and things that went in for watch repairs, because th these things had no value. Um, the biggest single item they had are what's called mountings. If you purchase an expensive ring, there is usually a gold band and there is a stone. Right, The stone, be it a sapphire or a diamond, needs to sit in the ring in the correct position so that it doesn't fall out, so that it's safe, and so that when your girlfriend shows it to all of her friends, it sparkles nicely under the light. To make that happen, they have a thing called a mounting, with a little square that you push into the gold and then you push the stone into the mounting and it keeps it safe. Right, these things cost you know, nothing. They're 10 bucks for, for a thousand or whatever. Right, those things are counted very, very rarely. So, inventory systems, perpetual stocking systems, think supermarkets, and the whole purchasing chain is linked through that system. Periodic systems, things that don't suit perpetual systems, so we count them periodically. Periodically, every once, in a certain period of time. High risk items, money in banks, jewelry in jewelry shops, expensive stones and so on, will be maybe twice a day, less valuable items maybe once a week, and items which are not of so much value every year. Remember that with your perpetual system, you almost certainly have some periodic system that goes with it anyway, just to make sure that there are not big differences between what's in your computer system and what's really in your warehouse. And your periodic system will pick up wastage, damage, stealing, wrong orders, and so on and so forth. Okay, those are the two mains of inventory systems. If you're gonna get this in ACCA, ICAS, um, ICAW, wherever, you're probably gonna to have to describe them. So I've given you some examples there as well, supermarkets and jewelry shops. Okay. Okay, so we looked in the previous slides at stock systems or inventory systems. Now what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at the situation where we have items in our inventory and those items are, let's assume, nice and simple, we're back to our supermarket, that they're sold. So a government-controlled supermarket, if we're looking at Ipsos, we haven't talked specifically about Ipsos so much this time. The question, therefore, is which cost do we allocate to our cost of sales? Because as your goods have accumulated in the warehouse, they have different costs. So when they're allocated out, what costs do we allocate? What cost do we charge across to the cost of sales? I hope that hasn't confused you at all. Right, three different ways to do this. FIFO, LIFO, and weighted average. I have to say that examiners across the world, be they in Britain, at ACCA, or wherever, they always do this with numbers as well. So you very rarely have to explain what you're actually doing with this. You just have to calculate the numbers. And, and it really isn't, you know, advanced mathematics. Um, having said that, it's really important in real life how you do this because it can have very critical effects on, on your levels of profit and so on. So, everyone okay with what we're doing? We have some goods in our, in our warehouse. Those goods are, let's assume, sold. How do we allocate the cost? because it may not be possible to do it on, on, on actual cost. You know, in warehouses that are doing things like manufacturing cigarettes, there's millions of cigarettes coming in and out every day. Um, with barcoding systems, much easier to actually monitor the actual goods, but still. Anyway, first in, first out, let's move on to the numbers. So everyone okay with this scenario? We are a small supermarket, Ipsos, a government supermarket perhaps. So on the 1st of January, we buy 10 tins of um, beans. On 2nd of January, we buy another 10. And on the 3rd of January, we buy another 10. Right, very, very small quantities that we're buying. As you can see, there's rampant inflation in the bean market as well. On the 4th of December, 
17 of those tins of beans are distributed so they bearing in mind this is ipsis they could be given to soldiers for example or if it's a supermarket they could be sold right what are we doing we've 17 of them are gone so what is the cost of the 17 which has gone our system is called first in first out so in other words what comes in first goes out first so therefore we match with the order in which they were received so we said there are 17 that have gone so the first batch of beans came in on the 1st of January so we say that the first batch is all gone so if you look at the cost there it says 10 times 1 on the 1st of January we received 10 tins of beans and they cost $1 each so that batch is considered to have gone in completely make the assumption that the warehouse was empty at, at midnight on the first of, at the start of the 1st of January yeah so they're gone now we said that there were 17 so from the second batch that came in on the 2nd of January we lose or we distribute 7 those ones had a value of 110 each so therefore we do 7 times 110 which gives us a value of goods distributed of £17.17 .17. right I hope that's clear for everyone the math is fairly simple and in real life it'll be done for you by the computer anyway right what is important for you is that and you will get asked this in exams is when do you use this so when in real life would you expect to see a first in first out right we use first in first out in any industries where it is important that the oldest goes first okay right food is the obvious one if you're looking at fruit and vegetables it has a shelf life of what two three five days even if like in America they cover it with chemicals to keep the fruit from bruising and so on it still goes fairly quickly so if you're asked to give an example of this first in first out would be used in an industry where it's important that it's done in that order food is the obvious one other things that you would see would be fashion um, kind of items as well where things change very quickly mobile phones and so on you are almost certainly looking at first in and first out okay right I hope that you can do the numbers for yourself and I hope that you understand when it's used and what it is if you have any questions send them through the website emmyfielding.com and I'll do my best to answer okay so our cost systems remember we've purchased some items a proportion of those items have now been distributed or sold or given away or whatever and we need to allocate a value to those items which have gone and I guess therefore to those items which are staying technique number one really simple I hope FIFO number two is weighted average so with the weighted average what we do is we take an average cost of the items so once again we got the same scenario our warehouse was empty in December on the 1st of January we purchased 10 tins of beans 2nd of January another 10 3rd of January another 10 and then we distributed 17 what we're doing here with the average cost therefore is we're working out what is the average cost of one tin of beans so we're saying we've got these 30 items here what is the average cost so I hope you can calculate that the average cost is 1.05 so one dollar and five cents and therefore the cost of the items which have been distributed is 17 bucks 85 being 17 tins of beans at a value of one dollar and five cents each okay right we use it for as you can see they're generic items this is things where we have a very very high volume of identical items and usually you'd actually find that the price changes are, are very very small or where it is just literally physically impossible to keep a total on what the cost of these things are right the best example is when you're selling things like liquids so petrol gas yeah 
you have a huge storage tank for all of your petrol and when the lorry comes it just chucks the new stuff in with the old and it goes in together and you can't go well this this liter of petrol arrived on the 1st of January and this liter of petrol arrived on the 2nd of January it's just not possible so we use weighted average and weighted average in real life is actually much simpler than FIFO because we don't need to identify specific costs with specific items. We just say this batch arrived and we add it to the pool and then we take a proportion out. So in real life, weighted average is much easier. Okay, once again, the same rules apply for weighted average as FIFO. In other words, you should be able to do the numbers and you should know when it's used. Okay. Your third and final method is called LIFO. So LIFO is, I guess, broadly similar to FIFO, except instead of the first goods, it is the last goods. So in other words, what comes in last is deemed to go out of the door first. So here you can see once again, we bought our 10 tens of beans, first, second, third of January. We distributed 14. And now what we do, therefore, is we say that the 10 tins that were purchased on the 3rd of January, they go first. And then the second batch is the ones purchased on the 2nd of January. And those items which remain, therefore, will be the ones from the 2nd of January, being three tins, and all 10 tins on the 1st of January. Okay. That's LIFO. Once again, I hope that if you can understand FIFO, you can understand LIFO. You'll get your head around this. Um, I have to say that LIFO gets a very, very bad rap. It's not permitted under international accounting standards, certainly under IFRS. And when I used to be teaching back in my good old days in Moscow, I used to get so many students who used to write, oh, but this is used by people who are just trying to minimize their tax liabilities and so on and so forth. Um, Right, in real life, there are many, many companies, companies that use this as a method for calculating the value of their stock. Um, and not because there are a whole bunch of criminals who should all be thrown in prison, but simply because it makes the most practical sense for them. LIFO is used in real life, and certainly in companies' management accounts, most of all, most obviously in the mining industry. Now, if you think about it, what happens with a coal mine? Let's assume that we're mining coal. Well, you go down into the ground, you dig your coal out of the ground, and you put it on top of a heap of coal. When the lorry comes up and says, please, you know, fill me up with coal, what happens? Well, you don't lift the heap of coal up and take from the bottom of the pile, you take from the top. So what's being sold is what came out the ground last. And so therefore it makes perfect sense. And it's the same with, with certain types of liquids when they don't automatically just mix. Certain, certain organizations, when you, they put the liquid into the big gasometers of liquid, they will use LIFO systems. And it's because economically it makes the most sense to them. Particularly if what, what you've got in your heat doesn't degrade or anything. So you don't need to get rid of the bottom stuff. It can stay there for years, yeah. So please don't write in exams if you're doing ACCA that, you know, this is just the, the preserve of, of bandits, criminals, and fraudsters. It's a very, very practical tool, and it, and it works in real life, and it's used extensively in real life. Those of you who do mining gas, oil, and so on will, will come across this a lot. Okay, you've got your three different systems. Next slide, we'll compare them. Okay, so this is your this is your comparison. So there is a FIFO. You can see that the cost of your inventory, which was distributed, was lowest under FIFO, highest under LIFO, and so therefore your cost of sales is highest under LIFO. I have to say that LIFO shouldn't be used. It's not particularly liked by international accounting standard setters. As an individual, I personally don't like it in the exam, right what the examiner wants to hear, which is it shouldn't be used unless there's a good practical reason. And it's not actually a permitted method. Um, I have to say that it is a normal accounting method in certain industries and some companies will 
in their accounts take an exception to IFRS and use it anyway. And I don't think that there's anything wrong with that as long as there's a good reason. Okay, what's important for you is that you understand what the difference is. So look at those cost of sales figures. You are therefore going to, assuming that those tins of beans were sold for the same price, you're going to get different levels of profits. Yeah, and that's what you should be noticing. So in the exam, make sure that's your conclusion. And LIFO will give you the lowest profit in times of rising prices and the highest profit in times of falling prices. Okay, just a very, very small finish up then. We looked at inventory systems. Bearing in mind that we're looking at IPSAs and IFRS, please don't think that this isn't relevant for governments. All of the stuff about LIFO, FIFO, all of the stuff about perpetual inventory systems is absolutely relevant for governments, as relevant as it is for Tesco's and Verizon and Ford and so on. Just one final thing, those of you who've read IFRS's will know that your inventory is valued at the lower of cost or realizable value under inventory systems. This is an IPSAS specific slide here, is that, and it says here, uh, unlike organizations which account under IFRS, governments have inventory items which are not sold. You, you may actually find that commercial organizations have these as well. Um, people who work in Tesco's on the shop floor have uniforms. Those uniforms are distributed to those people. So they will not have a cost either. What Ipsos say is that if you have items of inventory which are not to be sold, then you will account for them at the lower of cost or replacement value. So you will see this in particular, therefore, items have no, no sale value. So items have no sale value like police uniforms or so on, but it's likely that we have materially amount, material amounts of inventory in these items. You know, the, the army, for example, army uniforms and so on, these things have no, they, they, they have no net realizable value. And so it becomes much, much more relevant for organizations. When you're looking at stock, or inventory, if, you, if you're looking at this from a government, from an Ipsos point of view, if there are items where you're thinking, well, the net realizable value is nothing, then you need to go on and look back at the standard and say, well, should we be valuing these things at the lower of cost or replacement value? If they're material items and they will affect the decision making of account users, then you should. So therefore, in these systems, when we look at these things, if you're looking at bullets in the Ministry of Defense, if you're looking at uniforms in Ministry of Defense, for example, then we should not be showing our items at the lower of cost or net realizable value. We should be showing them at the lower of cost or replacement value, because otherwise we will be materially understating our stock. Now, there is again this idea with things like bullets is to say well one bullet is it is it you know what we call a small item and so certain certain ministries of defense will say well we just expense them when we buy them so that that's an that's um, an um, an option as well but when you're looking at the government level if you're looking at items of stock and they are materially valued do look and see from the standard whether you should be valuing at the lower of cost or replacement value rather than the lower of cost or net realizable value. Okay, thanks very much for listening. My apologies that this has been so late, but we are just massively wretched off of our feet. You know the deal now. If you've enjoyed this, please subscribe, please like us on Facebook, and please send it to as many people as you can. If you haven't liked it, I'm terribly sorry about that, but please comment as well, because we, you know, we're trying to produce what's really, really useful and valuable, um, and, and negative comments help as well. Hey, happy studying, guys. If you have any specific questions, please let us know. Thank you. Bye-bye now.